Um, I'm actually a bit more nervous than last time. I don't know why, but um, so maybe because um, we're close to releasing a new version, and uh, I've just been boggled by work. But today I want to talk about something. You know, it has something to do with Vue, as you'd expect, but it's not a sales pitch. Um, it's really about my uh, interesting discovery that uh, we are seeing a new trend of defining UI components somewhat differently from what we've been used to. And uh, so let's dive in. How many of you remember code like this? Um, Backbone, the good old framework that introduced the custom MVC into front-end engineering. And this is how we define a view in Backbone. It, it's not necessarily the equivalent of a component as we see today, but you see the familiarity, and you can instantly understand what it's trying to do. And uh, uh, in case you've noticed, Vue's current API actually takes some note from this as well. Uh, we have Vue.extend. But then we have something called ES classes. Uh, ever since class arrived, it seemed just obvious that we should just use classes to define components now. Right? Um, and in fact, a lot of these major frameworks today do that. Um, React did create class to use class. Uh, Angular obviously used classes. Um, Ember, Aurelia, a lot of these um, early pioneers that used to use the, this object-defined format for defining components moved to classes once it became an actual part of the spec. But is class really the best way to define components? Well, it seems pretty good because um, classes allows us to define state and define methods that would manipulate that state. This is what every UI component tries to do. And we use the instance of the, uh, of the class as the render context. So in order to expose the state and these methods to our templates or render functions, whichever, whichever you prefer. But um, and for a period of time, we've, we felt like, what? well, this seems like the obvious right way to do things. But then we discovered we actually need to do more with UI components than just dealing with state and functions that change state. We also have to deal with props or inputs, data that's passed into the component from the outside world, because we are actually using UI components. Uh, we were composing them in, in a view hierarchy, and there will be data flowing from top to uh, top down. So we need a mechanism to receive outside input. And you might find this familiar here. So just a disclaimer, this is not the API of an actual existing framework. It's intentionally generic so that it doesn't look like any one of them. But you might be, find some of them familiar. And then we also need to handle side effects in life cycles. Components, our UI components can be mounted, unmounted, hidden, shown, moved around. So there will be a life cycle for these components. And we need, sometimes just need to hook into it to perform side effects that that's not a direct result of rendering something onto the screen. For example, logging to the console is a side effect. Fetching some data and then do something is a side effect. Right? We need to hook into these life cycles. And then sometimes we need to also perform side effects reacting to state changes. Could it, it could be a change of a prop, or it could be a change uh, in the component's own state. But as you can see, we are starting to introducing more and more new concepts into a simple class. And a lot of these are not necessarily bound to the class syntax, like we are using a decorator here. We're using a special named hook, hoping that the framework will somehow know when to call it. And these are all hidden contracts, conventions, extra concepts that you need to know in order to alter a component using classes. So it's not simply a class anymore, right? Um, and even more, we have to sometimes uh, attach metadata to the component that simply no, there's no way to elegantly describe it in a class. Sometimes maybe you can use a stat cla static class field uh, to, to declare these extra metadata. But realize that class fields are still at stage three after all these years, and decorators still at stage two. Um, we've been using it for such a long time, and very few people actually realize that decorators is far, far away from actually being part of the language. It's undergone so many, uh, so many overhauls that uh, it's very different from what we kind of knew when it was first introduced. 
Another problem with classes is that logic reusing composition can be challenging at times. Not impossible, but challenging to get right. right? This is one of the reasons why uh, in the traditional OOP design, uh, design uh, circle, you, you hear the phrase all the time, favor composition over inheritance. You need to apply these patterns, these patterns, these patterns, just so that you can get it right. Um, and, and then another important problem is in front-end UI components, inheritance isn't really that useful. How many of you have actually had a direct uh, a class extends which follows is not actually just the base component, right? It's really rare. Um, the reason is UI component rarely works like this, a linear hierarchy of inheritance where the child class strictly extends the base class and just adds something on top of it. This is, we know this is inflexible because uh, you are encapsulating fixed behavior inside the base class, and when you have multiple child classes, each with different behavior, it more often looks like this, right? We're trying to have several different types of components, some of them with overlapping behavior. So it seems more, make more sense if we're just trying to compose things, right? But composition in classes is also challenging to get right. Um, you, it may come to mind that you can, we can use mixins, but mixins has its fair share of problems. Namespace clash, and, and when you use a lot of mixins, you don't really know which mixing injected which property, which is one of the reasons why React kind of declared mixings are dead, and you should use higher order components, and then render props, and then now we are trying to come up with something new. Um, and Angular tried to deal with this with service classes. Um, and then you need to go into the rabbit hole of understanding how hierarchical dependency injection works, finding out the right place to inject your services. And, um, and even services, service classes have the limitation of not being able to directly hook into your component APIs, because when you use a class, the component API exposed using these specially named hooks on your class methods. And inside a service class, which is isolated from your component class, it's not directly available. So, the coupling is also a problem. Well, this, all of these is not saying that classes is a bad choice. Well, people have been building great UI using class-based component APIs. But maybe, just maybe, components is not the most natural fit for describing UI components, or maybe it's not the only way of describing UI components. Um, so one thing I want to mention here is uh, we're talking about classes. We're also talking about sort of this uh, what I call semi-class-based APIs, like Views 2.x, object-based API, backbone views. Um, all of these kind of center around the idea that your component has an instance called this. And you somehow attach all your state onto this, and somehow you change everything through this. right? But what if we get rid of the concept of this? So um, in the past year, we saw some interesting new ideas appearing. and. Uh, some of you might have seen this tweet from me, uh, I think, a couple months ago. Um, got a bunch of likes, but I don't, I don't know how many people actually read these little comments. It's hard to see here, so we'll dig into them. Um, React hooks. Uh, how many of you have used React hooks? A lot of you. Great. Um, so React hooks was introduced last year, and the syntax looks like this. The interesting part is uh, React hooks is not actually defining the state on the spot. It's actually storing the state you're using uh, in an array on the underlying instance of your component instance. And these functions are called on every single update. And they are just retrieving the underlying states based on the call, call order index. So the first call of use state will retrieve the, first, uh, the state at the first slot on your component. Um, it's an interesting design. So, uh, so this is a, a short sort of a sampling of a few things you can do with classes. You can declare a state. You can define memoirs to derived state, sort of like a computed property. You can, um, you can uh, perform side effects in lifecycle hooks. Uh, so here, use effect when you pass it an empty array. It's like calling something unmounted. Uh, or you can react to changes, perform side effects based on only a part of the state that you care about by passing in this dependency array, like the plus one. Uh, or you can change the state by calling set count, which is a, a function specifically for that state that it can mutate. Um, we also have view composition API. 
So this is something that uh, we've been having RFC lengthy discussions in the Vue community about, and uh, went through some iterations. We have a plugin that allows you to try it out with Vue 2, and it's going to be shipped as built-in in Vue 3. Vue Composition API is really not introducing any new concept in terms of Vue, but more about exposing Vue's internal APIs, like allows you to explicitly create an object that is reactive, and then allows you to create a computed property based on that reactive state. It allows you to um, watch a function and automatically rerun it whenever the state it relies on changes. It allows you to inject lifecycle side effects. It allows you to mutate the state. Right? Doing the exact same thing as the last slide. And you can see the similarity in here. Right? The difference, major difference here is view composition API isn't repeatedly called on every render. This is called only once at your component startup. And then you return an object containing the things you want to expose as the render context. So behavior-wise, uh, this actually it leads to some very interesting behavioral differences compared to React classes. And then we also have Svelte, which is a very novel and interesting approach, Svelte 3 allows you to write your component code like this. This snippet is doing exactly the same thing as the previous two examples. But you can see it much more concise, interestingly. And it, doesn't, it looks a little bit different from the typical JavaScript that we know, because um, when you try to change state, it's directly mutating a local variable, which supposedly should have no side effects. It should not trigger anything. But somehow, Svelte makes it work. Um, but again, it looks quite similar. Similar. So uh, just to go back a little bit, and you can see two approaches, very different underlying implementation, but the conceptually, they share a lot of in common, a departure away from classes. So um, disclaimer, I'm the author of Vue, so I'm likely biased towards the composition API. Maybe you'll hate it. But here, I'm just really trying to focus on the trade-offs that went into these designs. So let's go into them. The common theme, we're moving away from a declarative bag of options object or a bag of methods defined on a class to a more, somewhat more free form way of defining components. Notice I'm not using the term imperative or procedural here, because uh, we're still writing components. We're still uh, de declaratively rendering stuff. We're still composing a review using components. It's not we're going back to imperative programming to code UI. It's just we are using a more free-formed format for authoring and defining our component logic. The pros, the biggest obvious pro of React Hooks is it enables some really, really smooth and easy logic composition. Right? So custom hooks prefix with the use uh, prefix um, allows you to encapsulate arbitrary logic. You can just really take any part of your component logic out into an external function. And then you can share it across components. So you can encapsulate a global theme sharing logic, inject the is dark property. So these are all hypothetical use cases. But notice how you can pass the result return from one hook into another. So this is kind of cross-module composition. And then in a hook like use mouse position, the hook may contain side effects like setting up a global event listener and also contain the code that cleans up that listener. Nicely hidden away. And then you can compose arbitrary number of these uh, different function modules very clearly inside your component, because it's very clear which property is coming from which uh, custom hook you're using. So here is a screenshot that when hooks were introduced, people start to realize how much nicer it feels when you transition from classes to hooks. Uh, notice how uh, features pertaining to different uh, code to pertaining to different features colored in different uh, background colors. When they move to hooks, they, come, they can be naturally grouped together. And the code becomes shorter, too. Another big pro of hooks is hooks design is actually directly sort of a side effect result uh, of the, uh, the incoming concurrent mode. So React concurrent, concurrent mode allows you to slice work up, schedule them, make sure your apps stay responsive. Um, but it also sort of 
leads to some limitations because uh, React has to design an API that forces you, somehow forces you, to write code that is concurrent mode friendly. And hooks is one of the pieces of that grand scheme. So here I'm going to talk about some cons of the hooks design. So uh, don't worry, I'll talk about the cons of other solutions too, including views. So um, first thing is you have to manually manage the dependency array of use effect or use memo. Um, you have to remember to pass in the correct things so that they in, the inner callback invalidates correctly. Uh, and you have to rely on a linter to get right because it's close to impossible for you to always remember to pass in the correct things. And that indirectly leads to the stale closures problem. So if you've used hooks, you likely know what I'm talking about. Um, when, when, you pass some, when you pass a function into use effect, that function uh, may get reused across subsequent renders. And if your dependency array is not invalidating that inner callback correctly, then your inner callback captures the variables of a stale closure. So in this case, it might be a little bit surprising, especially when you first start to use hooks, that the inner count will always lock zero because it's always capturing that count variable from the first render. So the correct way of doing this is you have to pass in the count in the array and then properly reset, uh, tear down and reset up the set interval every time count changes. So now let's talk about View Composition API. Interestingly, View Composition API has the almost exact same composition capabilities. As you can see, this is the exact same snippet from the React Hooks example. And you can pretty much do the same thing in View Composition API. Um, there's really not much. Uh, in terms of composition capabilities, it's almost the same. And we also have real world cases where when we refactor a big old options API-based component into Composition API, we see how the code becomes much more coherent for each feature, uh, nicely grouped together. Well, um, another difference is um, because we're caught only once, so Vue has this concept of automatic dependency tracking. When you try to react to state changes, when you try to compute something and memoize it, um, you don't have to think about when something changes or when something validates, because Vue automatically tracks everything you've touched inside the execution of your code uh, so that you don't need to think about it. Well, here comes the cons. We need the concept of because uh, we're not invoked on every render, somehow we need to be able to pass a reference to primitive values around so that we can track its reactive changes. So this ref concept is basically an object that wraps an inner primitive value so that we can somehow pass it around without losing its reactive connection to the original. So now we have two concepts. We have the concept of a ref and the concept of a plain reactive object, which is something you kind of have to juggle around from time to time. But just so you know, when dealing with the stale closure problems in hooks, React also has a ref concept, which is different from state. So. Um, Trade-offs, trade-offs. And then there is the runtime dependency collection overhead, right? Uh, it's relatively fast and efficient, but uh, when you have a huge amount of data, it can still be a noticeable overhead. So that's just the intrinsic trade-off we're making. Well, then let's talk about Svelte. The pro of Svelte is it obviously offers the most concise code. The way Svelte does it, um, is a little bit interesting because it's all compiler-based. Imagine you are writing a Babel plugin that translates the view example. Well, we can't actually write a Babel plugin that reverse convert Svelte syntax into the view syntax. And we can also write a Babel plugin that convert the view syntax into the Svelte syntax. Uh, but underlying, uh, the, the way Svelte does it is when you, inside the increment function, when you mutate the count, Svelte injects another line of code underneath it saying invalidate count. So, and inside your component, whenever you, in, in your template, if you use count, then inside the, up, the, the views update function, Svelte will add a line saying check if count has changed. If has changed, update this part of the DOM. Smart, right? And very efficient. Very, uh, very little runtime overhead and also um, 
it's automatically tracking the dependencies, so you don't have to worry about it yourself. Um, well, there are also some interesting limitations to this, because um, this syntax is very tightly bound to the current component context. So when you lift it outside of the component, it just doesn't make sense anymore. right? It's, it doesn't make sense without a component context. So when you're trying to share logic across Smell components, you are suddenly have to do without this magical syntax. And you have to drop down to a different, completely different set of APIs called Svelte Store, which looks quite similar to Vue's composition API in some way. But well, here, here's the thing is, when you have a compo big component written, uh, because Svelte syntax relies on this magical conversion, you can't really just like freely take it out of your component, share it with another one, or extract it into reusable utilities. Uh, you kind of have to rewrite it with a different syntax to be able to reuse it. Another thing is, some of the custom syntax Svelte is using confuses third-party tooling, like TypeScript. Um, TypeScript really don't understand where this plus one comes from. It's interesting because um, syntax-wise, Svelte is still valid JavaScript. Uh, this dollar sign colon is actually a label uh, in the Java. It's a valid JavaScript syntax, but when you try to give the label a different semantics, then what Java, it means in JavaScript, you are inventing something kind of behaves differently from JavaScript. And that confuses third-party tooling. Uh, and um, sometimes you would also uh, create little weird cases where, for, for example, when you have an array and you mutate its inner values, you have to assign the array to itself to let Svelte know that the array has been mutated. Um, so as you can see, um, three approaches, similarities, different trade-offs, uh, different design decisions. Uh, it's hard to say which one is the best, even like as biased as I am. I don't think any one of them sort of is a clear, has a definitive advantage over the others. Uh, but another thing to note is this common departure from class is not about functional program versus uh, OOP. Because as you can see, even when using classes, you're not necessarily building your UI with OOP principles. And even when you're using not using classes, like in these examples, they're not really that functional programming-esque. Um, so just want to make it clear, this is not about FP versus OOP at all. Uh, I'd prefer to think about these approaches uh, as thinking of UI components as instantiable stateful modules. Right? Uh, imagine how you write your typical JavaScript today. You start with an ES module. It's it's sort of procedural code inside the module, but then you can freely group your logic into functions. You can extract those functions into another module. You compose them together, importing functions, calling functions here, inside functions, inside functions. Right? So um, it kind of gives us, give us an ability to sort of think about constructing UI, our component UI logic more natural like we're just writing normal JavaScript. Instead of sort of trying to fill in boxes, uh, filling in these blanks left to us by a framework um, in the, presented to you in the form of a class. Right? So um, are these definitely better than classes? Are one of these better than the other? I honestly don't know. Uh, they're all pretty new, right? Most of them are all around only around for one year or so. And I think there are pr plenty of room for improvements and future iterations. And overall, I'm just really excited to see these new ideas coming up. And I'm excited to be on this journey with you guys and try to find better ways of building web, web applications. Thank you. Yeah.